Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Alan Gilman with All Saints Lutheran Church for March the 29th, 2020. I'm here in my home because the church is closed due to the current virus crisis, and I hope everyone is coping well and doing okay. If you have any needs or you have any questions uh, and you don't know who to reach out to, please send me an email at pastor at allsaintslutheran.ca, and if I I'm not able to help you. I will look for the person who can. Uh, So please don't hesitate to do that. We're continuing our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark called The Remarkable Gospel. This version of the story of Jesus was likely the version that Peter the Apostle told. And Mark uh, was a companion of Peter who seemed to eventually write Peter's version of the story of Jesus down, and we've called it, the, or I have called it, the Remarkable Gospel, because it is this version of the story is especially written to, it seems, to evoke reaction and response, hopefully the right reaction and response, but it, we see the people in the various uh, stories that are told reacting, even, even we're going to see in, in this week's a message that Jesus himself uh, was astounded uh, uh, by what was going on around him. So we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, if you haven't listened or, or or watched this sermon series, we I provided a video of last week's, and there's the audio of the entire series. You can get that at the All Saints Lutheran Church website, allsaintslutheran.ca, and you can go to this <clears throat> the sermon section. There's a link at the top. If you don't see that, there should be a big button in the middle. Listen slash watch. And uh, uh, you could also go to directly to allsaintslutheran.ca slash podcast slash media to get that. Uh, And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to look and begin to look at another couple of stories that seem to have some sort of relationship to one another. We're going to see in the first one, um, how uh, a story of ineffectiveness, and you'll see what I mean in a moment, and then a story of effectiveness following that, which we're going to look at God willing next week, which is Palm Sunday. And uh, so for now, uh, I'm going to read both those short sections. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 13. We're, uh, we're going to be focusing on verses 1 through 6. But before we do that, why don't we pray? Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that your word is true and that you have given of yourself to us that we could have comfort and help and even be effective in this very difficult time. Lord, there's a lot of confusion. There's suffering. Um, people are cooped up, and it's very difficult. We're, we're away from one another. We pray that, that you would break through in a very special way, uh, whether through this message and all the various messages that are going out in this format, and um, as, as as people are are stuck in their homes, and we look to you, Lord, that you would do what you want to do in our lives, in spite of the restrictions and difficulties we're facing at this time. We thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, Matthew six, starting at verse one. He, that is Jesus, went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, there again, there's reaction, right? They were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? Where is the, what, sorry, what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, 
no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunic and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Well, that's pretty remarkable. And as I said, we're going to be looking at the sending out of, of the 12 next week. But this week, we're going to see a, what's in many ways a strange story. Because in, in this story, when Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth, it says he could do no miracle there. So we'll look at that. So um, let's start again at uh, the beginning. And uh, again, in uh, verse 1, it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And so Nazareth was his hometown. We know that, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and following that, because of the danger, they fled to Egypt for a time. Nobody knows exactly how long that was. At some point, they go to Jerusalem, and we don't know if exactly how their travels went, but eventually they settled back in where Joseph and Mary were living before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which uh, was the town of Nazareth, which is part of the Galilee area, where most of uh, Jesus' mighty works were done, at least in the first half of the story, uh, before he goes down to Jerusalem. And we know that in actuality, uh, he, he traveled uh, the whole length of the land of Israel, um, but there's quite a focus in the northern part in the region of Galilee. And that's where Nazareth was, and that's not too far, especially when you're driving, uh, to Capernaum, uh, which became his headquarters. So we saw him uh, teaching and, and doing miracles in Capernaum right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a lake in Israel. It's called Lake Kinneret. Uh, and then at some point, he goes back to Nazareth, uh, his hometown. And his disciples followed him. So we're at a stage now, he's going back to his hometown, and his followers are following him. Because that's, that's what followers do. Verse 2, And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Well, nothing unusual about that. Note that he was welcome to do this. Uh, we don't know at what point he began teaching as as an adult in uh, in the local synagogue so it's not as if what we see later on where the people have difficulty with him it's not as if he when he returned there that he immediately uh, was uh, rebuffed rejected uh, he was welcome to teach and then it goes on and says uh, it's still in verse 2 and many who heard him were astonished saying where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by him? And so, whether they're reacting now to the things that they have heard him do elsewhere, or whatever, or things that he was saying, because we're not told what he actually taught at this point, um, the people are having a hard time. And... Um, the reason why they're having a hard time with him, why they're astonished, and this Greek word, uh, which I'll try to pronounce, ekpleso, ekpleso, uh, there's a bit of cynicism in their astonishment. And there's all these different words, Greek words, in the Gospel of Mark that describe being amazed, being astonished, being astounded, marveling, and this sort of thing. There's all, all other emotions too, and fear, and, and so on. There's a lot of reaction, as I mentioned at the beginning. It's a quite emotional telling of the story. And they're astounded or astonished um, because of, as it says, many of the things they heard him saying. And they're like, where did he get these things? And, and what's going on is they're stumbling over him. And, and this, is, this is mentioned as well. They're having trouble with him, they are offended. Um, because specifically because of, of familiarity. You know, the, the expression familiarity breeds contempt. 
Well, that's what was going on here. Then they say this, verse 3, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So just as I was saying, uh, this is a different word. Uh, uh, it's scandalizo. A little trouble with my Greek today, but I'm going to keep pressing on here. And uh, it's it's where we get the the English word scandalized. And it's the idea of stumbling over something, uh, which we understand to be taking offense. And so they were upset by, they stumbled over him and what he was doing. Why? Because they had known him so well. They grew up with him. Uh, and I don't know what you picture when you think of the child the or the teenage Jesus, uh, but it's not as if he went around uh, three, uh, you know, six inches over the ground hovering. Um, he didn't glow in spite of how we see it in, in painting sometimes. Um, he actually looked just like everybody else. And in many ways, he was a kid just like everybody else. Uh, we know that he was sinless, but that didn't that doesn't mean that he never tripped and fell like it's not as if when he learned to walk um as a baby that uh he just when it was time to walk started walking uh he as a baby he would have had to have his diaper change however he they did diapers in those days he was just like everybody else i and i get the impression that people are really uncomfortable with that concept but it's so important to understand that when the Son of God became a man, became human, he became fully human. Uh, he, retain, he was sinless. He, he didn't die for any wrong of his own. He was truly sinless. And he retained his godness, with, but that didn't diminish his, hum, his humanity. He really was a human being. And so, this might be a stretch for you, for many people, but he had a dirty face and, and he, he probably, and he tripped and fell and he skinned his knee and it had to be cared for. We know he bled. We know he was able to be wounded or else he wouldn't have been able to die. His suffering would have been meaningless. He really suffered. He really died and he really rose from the dead. Uh, but he was really like he was really like us in terms of normal human weakness and limitation. And um, the reason why I'm emphasizing this so much is we need to understand that to understand why the people had a hard time with him. They had a hard time with him because he knew he was just one of everybody else. Of course, they didn't they didn't fully understand what his true identity was they just knew that he, and, and you, uh, you may not know but the name jesus um which in some parts of the world is a very common name uh it is uh, the hebrew word yeshua or yehoshua which is joshua and it was a very common name there's great significance in that name which i'm not going to share now but he was just one of the guys. He was just one of the kids that grew up in Nazareth. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where somebody from your town went away and became famous. And uh, in your minds, what do you mean he's famous? Like, we knew this. We played with him and, and, and we went to school with him and all this sort of thing. And on one hand, we can be really proud of somebody from our hometown who's become famous. Um, or it's like, huh, you know, huh. I, I know this guy, I know his parents, I know his, I know his, his brothers and sisters. Yeah. And that's what was happening with these people. And this is how they were reacting to him. And, uh, and so on, they, they had trouble with how extraordinary that he was. Now, this is not unusual, as I've been trying to say. And Jesus understood this. Verse 4, and Jesus said to him, them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. You know, when somebody is given the words of God, and, and this also applies, somebody 
um, goes off someplace and, and becomes super knowledgeable in something really different from what their relatives understand, um, it could be really hard to take. And that's the principle that Jesus says here. This is just the way it is, but they should have known better. They still should have known better. It's still difficult, but they should have known better. Verse 5, and this is this is astounding. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few people and healed them. Theologically, I have a hard time with this idea that somehow Jesus was limited because of the lack of faith of the people in Nazareth. Now, it's a little funny. It's actually quite humorous that it says that he, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. So he still healed a few people. But he didn't heal to the extent that he could have, would have, if they would have believed. And as I've shared other places and other times, maybe at last week as well, I'm sure, because, yeah, I did. Faith is trust. They didn't trust him. They didn't trust who he was. They didn't trust in what he could do. Remember, we looked last week at the woman with the flow of blood. And what did she know? Obviously, she wasn't from Nazareth. Obviously, she didn't grow up with him. She didn't suffer from familiarity breeds contempt. All she had heard was reports about him. And that was good enough for her to, to break through a crowd and risk um the embarrassment of it all, making all these other people ritually unclean, just maybe if I touch his garment, I'd be healed. And she was because of her faith. Yet these people missed out because they stumbled over him because we knew him when he was a kid. And yet he's still able to do some things. But let that, let that not get in the way of what God is trying to show us through this that our lack of trust limits the work of God in our lives. And again, I don't understand how this works, but this is how it works. And even Jesus, verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Here again. How could this how could how could the son of god marvel at anything well it's not the only time that that he does this he actually marvels at at people's faith at times that he can be impressed this one he's dumbfounded that their lack of trust could be so great and why we know this guy. And that was enough to shut down the faith dynamic in their lives. And then it says, and he went about among the villages teaching. Well, he kept on keeping on. He didn't let this get him down and, and discourage him and stop him from going to the next place, a place that wasn't his hometown, where they wouldn't be treating him this way. He offered this wonderful opportunity to his hometown and the people blew it, but that didn't stop him, and he, he continued on. Well, what are some of the implications of, of this story? Um, well, picture now, here's this town going about what they always went about, and then Jesus does his ministry in various places, and he comes. And his presence would mean that they'd have to start thinking differently, thinking differently about him, thinking differently about what God wanted to do in their midst. But they preferred the same old, same old than the opportunity that they had to see God break through into their lives. And so their inability or their unwillingness to allow change to come into their lives, to allow the status quo to be changed, to allow their lives to be upset, to see things a little bit differently, kept them in a prison of, of, of oppression 
they would continue to be oppressed by demons. They'd be continued to be oppressed by sickness. They'd be continued to be oppressed by wrong ways of thinking. And they would just be stuck where they were. You know, could you imagine the disciples in the storm that we looked at a couple of weeks ago? Was it three? Is it three? Three weeks ago. And if I got that wrong, I got that wrong. Look it up. Imagine the disciples in the storm. They get to the other side. They have survived uh, this, this incredible, they thought they were going to die, and they survived, and they're soaking wet, and they get out of the boat, and they throw themselves on, on the ground, and then, oh, and, and, and here's what they say. Well, I'm glad that's over with. And a lot of us, we go through things in life, and we get to the other side of it, and it's, well, I'm glad that's over with, and we haven't learned anything. Now, thankfully, that's not what they did. Their reaction to Jesus calming the storm was at least to allow themselves to, to be messed up in their minds. Who, what manner of man is this that he calms the winds and the waves? They were impacted, and they continued on with him. And they would, he would continue I don't know, do I have to say excuse the expression? Mess them up. Um, disturb their way of thinking. Disturb their normal ways of living. To allow themselves to be changed, transformed. And next week we're going to look at how they would go out and they would make a difference in people's lives and deliver them. But they needed to allow themselves to be messed up first. To be changed first. To be transformed first. Unlike the people in Nazareth who were so stuck that we knew him when he was a kid. Who does he think he is? Eh. And it's so easy to be eh. And, and here we are. For some of us, for some of us, this is not the first major crisis. Um, but this is a big one, folks. And we've just gotten started. I don't want to scare you. But we haven't seen a lot of people die from COVID-19 yet. Maybe you know someone. Maybe you're currently sick. Maybe you know someone who's sick. Um, I was talking to my family doctor uh, just yesterday, and uh, his uh, cousin's father-in-law in their 70s had an underlying heart condition, died from COVID-19. And I thought, I think that's the first person I know, and I don't know them. So it's my doctor's cousin's father-in-law well maybe you have a friend or a relative that's already died uh, recently i heard somebody posted on facebook the description of this person that they knew uh, was describing what it was like to have the illness and they recovered thank the lord um, it was terrible and it, i don't know anybody directly yet but maybe it's going to be me maybe it'll be somebody in my in my household or family um we know of places in the world where it's already terrible. And uh, I don't want to say it to scare you, but are we just going to hunker down? And if we survive this, are we going to get through it? And it's going to be, well, I'm glad that's over with. And I don't think we're going to be able to do that because we're all going to be touched by this. But this is an opportunity to know God like never before. If if this situation, if this crisis is rattling us, we could just build up more defenses. We could try to tough it out. Or we could cry out to the Lord for personal help, for help for our family members, help for our church community, help for our neighborhoods, help for whomever. But this, this is upsetting. Are we going to let this upsettingness drive us to greater knowing of God and reliance on Him? Or is it going to completely devastate us? Or are even worse, just tough it out, get to the other side, and it's going to make no difference. I think that's one of the greatest tragedies of all, to get so stuck in our cynicism that it's our prison uh, until the day we die. Let not that happen. Let's not be like the people of, of 
of Nazareth. Let's be like that woman that we heard about last time, breaking through. In, and we can break through in prayer. Oh God, where are you? Where are you at this time? How come it's so difficult for me to, to, to know your presence? And he will answer that prayer. It may not be in the way that you expect or prefer, but if we cry out to him, he will answer us. Now maybe, now maybe, God has broken through. Maybe you know God in a way that some of the people around you don't. Maybe you have something to bring to your family and friends. And maybe you're the one, like Jesus, maybe you're the one who has been treated this way or will be treated this way, where you're treated with contempt, cynicism, because, ah, what do you know? Maybe you're the one in your family that's saying, we need to be praying. We need to be studying the word more. We need to get our act together. We need to repent. And maybe you're not being received. Well, you're in good company. That's what happened to Jesus. Don't let it get to you. So a couple words of advice. If you haven't done this already, seek God about how you reach out to your loved ones. Don't just barge in and, you know, I've got a great idea. Seek God and let him lead you about what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. And then when you do, you may not do it perfectly. If you, if you offend your loved ones and, it, and you really were out of line, say you're sorry. Sooner the better. But try again. They're your loved ones. Keep on praying for them. Don't give up. And if, they re if people won't listen to you, then find somebody else to share what God has placed on your heart. And if they won't listen to you, God always will. So keep looking to Him and let Him speak to you and let Him guide you. This is a very serious time. I already mentioned asking for forgiveness if, you know, we need to and we've blown it. Well, there might be people in your life, even from decades ago, that really you need to reach out to. This is the time to do it because soon it might be too late. And I want to urge you, this is always true, but especially at this time. I was taking a prayer walk, which is what I like to do in the morning, um, just a couple of days ago, and it hit, really hit me. There are people, that, are, even loved ones, that I may have seen for the last time. There are people that I may not be able to hug again. It's serious. So if, if you're holding a grudge against someone, it's time to let it go and not just forget about it. It's not just water under the bridge. Reach out. Reach out to your loved ones. Don't wait. Do the hard thing and start with yourself. Ask for forgiveness where it needs to be asked for, whether you receive it or not, whether they forgive you, it doesn't matter. You offer forgiveness. And in your heart, forgive those who have wronged you, no matter what their attitude might be. And if there's amends that need to be made, do whatever you can before it's too late. Let's keep our hearts open to the Lord. And where we find crusty parts, hard, hard areas of our hearts, ask God. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask him to soften you. Let him do what he wants to do in our, in our lives. And, and finally, let's not be like the people in Nazareth. Some of us have known the Lord for a long, long time. He first came into my life over 40 years ago. For some of you, it's longer. And it's so easy, even with God. Same old, same old, same prayers, same patterns, same ways of doing things. Is that what he wants at this time for you? It's very possible that la there's a lack of freshness in your life. And I don't know who I'm talking to, of course, right now. But I'm talking to those of you that it applies to. If you're feeling same old, same old with God, the problem is not with Him. He, he, there's a freshness about Him. There's always a newness with Him. Ask Him. 
speak to him. If you haven't opened his word, or if you've had a same old, same old way that you've approached the Bible, maybe it's time to do it differently. Get a, a new translation. They're available online. Oh, I don't read the Bible online. But if you can, maybe it's time to start. It's time to not do things the way we always did them. If they're working for you, really working for you, then fine. Just do what you've always been doing. If you're on a right, good track with God, just keep it up. But if it's not working, maybe it's time to change gears, change, you know, and, and I encourage you, the problem is not with God. The problem is not with Jesus. Turn to him and watch what he will do. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives and what you want to do in our lives. Thank you that you've promised never to leave us or forsake us. Lord, if in any way we have become, if we have become like the people of Nazareth, where we have treated you with contempt because of our familiarity, help us to confess that to you and help us to allow you to do whatever you want to do in our lives. Open us to the the freshness of what you want to do today and help us to be open to the, the different things and different the different things you want to do and the different ways you want to do it. Please, Lord, help us to reach out to those that we need to reach out to. May we know your forgiveness as we forgive others. Please, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, you can leave a comment uh, with this video. Uh, share it with other people. Uh, and if you have any questions or anything that you want to send directly to me, please do so at pastor at allsaintslutheran.ca. And so please keep well. May God's blessing and presence be with you. And I hope to see you soon.